Ephesians chapter 3, we've been in this great study. And Ephesians really is an itemized inventory of our blessings, and here's the key, in Christ. In Christ. As we study in this book, we've seen how rich we are. Let me remind you a little bit. We possess the riches of His grace, Ephesians 1, 7. The riches of His mercy, chapter 2, verse 4. The exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness toward us through Christ Jesus, chapter 2, verse 7. And then today we're going to see in chapter 3, the unsearchable riches of Christ. Now think about that. The unsearchable riches of Christ. Chapter 3, we're not get there today, but verse 16 says, and the riches of His glory. Uh, the front of our bulletin, if you have one of those you see on the front, that's been our theme this year and comes from this book, The Fullness of Christ. The fullness of Christ. Oh, uh, chapter 1 ends with verse 23, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. And then chapter 3 and verse 19 here, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. God wants you and I to be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand this morning, but if Paul is praying and Paul is preaching here and desiring and writing this from in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that you would be filled with all the fullness of God. He's writing to the church. He's writing to save people. Now, think, put your thinking caps on just a minute. If he's writing that you might be filled with all the fullness of God and you're already a believer... I don't want to embarrass anybody, but I wonder how many of us truly are filled with all the fullness of God. It's not something that just you happens at salvation. The Lord Jesus takes up his residence in you, but you have to give all of you to him. You got all of God when you got saved. You got all of Christ in you, the hope of glory. But he gets all of you only as you yield, him, yield to him day over day. Day by day. And so here we come to this great book on the fullness. And Paul is saying in Ephesians, dear friends, you have got to get a look at the true inventory we have in Jesus. All spiritual blessings found in Christ, chapter 1, verse 3. And he's saying, take another look. Take another look at Jesus, the love of our soul. A fresh look at the beloved. Fall in love with Jesus all over again. He's the chiefest among ten thousands, the altogether lovely one, the fairer than the fair, the glorious bridegroom of heaven. That's who Jesus is. Oh, the fullness of Christ. We've learned already in our study in Ephesians that the church is a body and that the church is a building, a temple. And here in chapter 3, we learn that the church is a mystery. Boys and girls, I know you're filling out a paper this morning. And that's going to be the first word I think you're going to write down at the very top. And I'll give you the whole phrase in just a minute. But this thought of mystery, mystery. Ephesians chapter 3. Let's begin reading verse 1. Take note of that word as we read. This is the emphasis of the passage here. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles... If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you word, how that by revelation he made known unto me, here we go, the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed with his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that, here it is, the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I am made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power unto me who am less than the least of all saints. Is this grace given? that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all men see. Oh, my God, help us. May he open our eyes this morning to behold, to see, to behold wondrous things out of his law and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. Here it is again, which from the beginning of the world 
has been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ to the intent that now under the principalities and powers and heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him Wherefore, I desire that ye faint not of my tribulations for you, which is your glory. We come to this title this morning. Here's your first blanks to write in, boys and girls, on your paper here. The unfolding mystery. That's the first one of God's grace. That's our title this morning. The unfolding mystery of God's grace. Would you bow with me in prayer? Father, we need you now. Oh, help us. We cannot see all that you have for us in Ephesians, except your precious spirit open our eyes to see. Lord, as Paul is writing here, as you are desiring to make all men see what you've done. Oh, would you help us not just to hear this morning, but to see by faith all that we have in Christ. We look to you for that now. I pray there'd be just a holy intensity, a, a a hush come over us and an intensity to hear you and that you truly would speak to our hearts now from your word in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Verse one, he says, for this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you. And right in the beginning, Paul reminds us and twice in this chapter, he'll remind us of his chains, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you. See, as Paul writes this, you have to keep in mind what it's cost him to share these truths. See, he is in prison for preaching what we're reading in comfortable clothes, in air conditioning, going to get something good to eat after. Amen. He's in prison for it. He's going to give his head for it. He's going to be executed by Nero for it. See, these truths are so important, so valuable, they're worth giving your life for. And he says to them, for the, this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. Wow. You see, we're reminded twice here of the physical realities of Paul where he's at. Paul is, I mean, he ends chapter two. Look at chapter two, the last verse. Verse 22, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Now, the chapter and verse divisions are very helpful for ease to turn to a specific spot, but they're not inspired. This was just a letter, and it just helps us to all find the same spot easily. So the next words are, for this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. And I don't know what it was. Maybe it was the rattle of the chain by the guard he was chained to. I don't know what it was. But as he's in the spirit, seeing what God is telling him and his secretary is writing it down as they allowed him on house arrest, chained to these soldiers. Something brought him down to this earth where he was. The reality, he was, maybe it was time for the guard and to change shifts. I don't know. Change position. We're reminded that Paul's a prisoner for Christ's sake. God's building his church through the Spirit. But the reality for Paul at this moment physically was he's in chains. Now keep that in mind as we go through the message. He's going to remind us again when we get to the end of the message. Maybe I'll just leave this here so we can all see the chain. That'll help us. Here he is in chains. Listen, what the Apostle Paul is writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit should not be taken lightly. He did not take it lightly. He was in chains for these truths. There's lots of reasons why we shouldn't take it lightly, but that's one. He's going to give, he's already given his liberty and he's going to give his life for it. Number one, I want you to see this morning the revelation of God's grace. As we think of the unfolding mystery of God's grace here, we're seeing the revelation of God's grace. We see that word given in verse uh, uh, let me see, I read it. Verse three, there it is. How that by revelation he made known unto me. And then again in verse five, it says he not now revealed unto his holy apostle and prophets by his spirit. 
Verse 2, notice, if we have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word. Paul was given these amazing truths and he's put under stewardship. You could write beside that word dispensation, the word stewardship. That's what it carries the idea of a stewardship, a trust that he was given of this wonderful truth. God had showed him that he's to communicate to the churches and that we now steward this same truth. We're to tell everyone and pass it on to the next generation. Paul's dead and gone. He can't tell anyone anymore except through what God used him to write. But this is the same stewardship. We'll see that as we go down in the message that we carry. But where in the world did this revelation come from? Well, turn over just a book back. Go to Galatians, would you? Galatians chapter 1. Paul gives us a little clue. Galatians chapter 1. Look at verse 15. Galatians 1 verse 15. The Bible says here, But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. Again, our title is The Unfolding Mystery of God's Grace. We'll see that emphasized all throughout, grace. Verse 16, to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Meaning I didn't ask anyone's opinion what I should do. When God said what to do, I did it. Verse 17, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me. But I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. He said, I conferred not with flesh and blood, but rather he sought out the silence of Sinai or Arabia. One author said it this way. He suggested the Holy Spirit came upon him and revealed new truths. He went into Arabia with Genesis, Isaiah and the Psalms in his luggage. And he came back with Romans and Ephesians and the Thessalonian books. In his heart, God revealed some things to him. Verse 3 and 4, back in Ephesians 3. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. As I wrote a four in a few words, back in chapter 1, he mentioned it. Verse 4, whereby when you read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Now let me start with the word mystery. I know when you think of mystery, we think of a certain thing. We think of, uh, you know, um, some movie or something we've seen, some mystery uh, solver, you know, and, and it, that's elementary, Watson, you know, and, and all that. We think of a whodunit, you know, type of mystery. That's not what the Bible's talking about. When he talks about mystery here, a mystery here, the Bible explains itself. I don't have to say it. Look at verse four, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge of the mystery of Christ. Now that's a parenthetical expression. It started at the end of verse three, which notice that word in verse five, which he's referring to the mystery of Christ, the mystery of Christ, which the mystery in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. The Word of God is the best commentary on the Bible, It's the, the Bible itself. And so he explains it. Notice verse 9. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. And so uh, J. Vernon McGee said it this way, there's two elements which always enters into a New Testament mystery. One, it can't be discovered by human agencies for it's always a revelation of God. Two, he said, it is revealed at the proper time and not concealed, and enough is revealed to establish the fact without all the details being disclosed. Uh, in other words, a mystery in the Bible is just something simply that had not previously been revealed. That's it. It's something, it's a truth, an everlasting truth here that had been hid in God until this moment when the Lord desired to reveal it. I think in your notes you guys have something about a mystery here that it is a sacred secret. That's the top one under number one. A mystery is a sacred secret. A sacred secret. This is just for the children, you adults, that might be confused. This is the children's sheet. All right, but you can write some things down too. That'd be great. So a mystery was once hidden, but now is revealed to God's people. Oh, I love this. It's nothing to do with something spooky at all. It means a sacred secret, a divine secret, once hidden, but now revealed to God's people. Listen, from all eternity, God has had our well-being in mind. You understand that, every one of you? From eternity past, God has had your well-being in mind. Listen to Colossians. <clears throat> Colossians 1, verse 26. 
even the mystery, same mystery you're talking about, which has been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. Manifest, there's that guacamole on the shirt word again. Y'all remember from the previous week, yeah. Manifest means to reveal, to shed light upon. You didn't know there was a guacamole stain until I moved my shirt, see. God had had it hid all this time, and now he's revealed it. There's no guacamole, if you're wondering. I can't see it, there isn't one. It's a joke. You had to be here last week to get it, all right? And so, revealed in God. This is something that was revealed in God. Notice verse 6, back in Ephesians 3, verse 6. The Bible says that the Gentiles, what is this mystery? That the Gentiles, let's just find out if we know. How many are Jews here? Are there any Jews here? Okay, how many are Gentiles? Raise your hand, raise your hand. Yeah, that's everyone else. In the Bible, there was nothing but Gentiles from creation. Then God called Abraham and the Jewish, Jewish family, Jewish became a nation, was started. And God operated through Israel, all the way through the Old Testament, we see that, to be his light to the world. But now here's the mystery that the Old Testament prophets had no idea about. The New Testament uh, people here are just getting their mind blown by it. And here it is, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Now you don't have to understand, if you were a Gentile in that day, a Jew would not come into your house for he'd be unclean. They would be unclean. They would not come in your house. And God's saying they're fellow heirs of God and of the same body. Never mind in your house, the same body. Christ the head were his body, the church. <laughs> All the Gentiles are like, <laughs> this is good news for us. But the Jews were not quite as happy. But this was always God's plan. We'll see that in just a minute. Uh, but let me keep sharing what Jesus says here. The Bible's telling us here about the mystery. Back up to chapter 2, verse 14, 15. We've already looked at this, but he's repeating this. Repetition's good for all of us, right? I don't get it the first time, neither do you, right? Chapter 2, verse 14, 15. For he, God, is our peace, Jesus, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. We talked about that with the walls in the temple and how uh, only Gentiles could come only so far and women so far and only the Jews which were clean could go in further. God's broken all that down. Even the veils rent in twain had broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make in himself of twain one new man so making peace it's amazing you go anywhere in the world they could be fighting in the streets but in God's house if it's truly a place where the Lord Jesus rules and reigns in his spirit doesn't matter the caste system it doesn't matter if there's different nationalities in Christ there's a wonderful unity and bond. Amen. You want to bring peace to the world? Bring Christ to the world. That's the only place there's peace. is in Christ. That's what he's saying. So making peace. Look at chapter 1. He talked about it in chapter 1. Look at verse 9 and 10. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure with which he has purposed in himself. Chapter 1 verse 10 of Ephesians. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ both which are in heaven and which are on earth even in him. Wow. See, he explains what a mystery is. And like I said, this is good news for us. This is, was, we're all gathered in himself, chapter 2, verse 15. In Christ, chapter 3, verse 6. Uh, chapter 1, verse 10 there. In him, in Christ. Remember, this was not a Paul concept. This was a Jesus concept. You remember our message last week on John 15. Abide in me. I'm talking about the vine there. As, I, as you abide in me and I in you. This Jesus was the one that began to teach that. And Paul is just teaching what God was already teaching. Now listen, if you've been paying attention in your reading and study of the Bible, it was no secret, no secret that God had always intended to bless the Gentiles as well as the Jews. 
I mean, we could go all over the Old Testament. Let me just remind you of one place where we've been studying. We've been studying Abraham. Remember Abram there in Genesis chapter 12. Remember the great promise there in Genesis 12? Uh, you could write this down. You can turn there if you want. But Genesis 12 verse 3. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curse, curseth thee and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Oh, I love how God's word fits together perfectly. See, it was no secret. Those intentions were stated in many Old Testament prophecies that God desired to use uh, Israel to be a blessing to the whole world. And God's heart was to be a blessing to the whole world. When he made Adam and Eve, they weren't Jews. The only thing there was was Gentiles. <coughs> Noah wasn't a Jew. They were Gentiles. No Jews existed until Abraham. And God called out Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, who changed his name to Israel. Then out of him came the 12 tribes of Israel. Again, God's loved all people at all times. And God's always desired to have all people part of his family. Hey, it was no accident God planted his people right on the land bridge that connected Europe and Asia and Africa so that people would pass through there. God wanted his chosen people to be a spiritual blessing to all mankind. You remember the book of Jonah? Remember Jonah? God called him to go to Nineveh. They hated the Ninevites. They hated the Assyrians. The Assyrians were ruthless people. Jonah didn't want to go. It went the opposite way. Finally, Jonah went after he got swallowed by whales, spit back out. Remember that? He goes and preaches. And he's not very compassionate about it. But God's word will work even with someone that's not compassionate. And sure enough, they repent. The whole city has a revival. One of the greatest revivals in the whole Bible, honestly. Even the king puts on sackcloth and ashes and they repent before God and God forgives and doesn't destroy the city. And Jonah even already knew it. God, I knew it. I knew you would be merciful if they would repent. That prejudice he had. See, all the way through the word of God, God loved the Ninevites. He loved the Assyrians. Hey, Abram, you remember we just we just looked at this in our study in Genesis. Abram, all this is yours. Every place you sold your foot touches from this river to here, all of it's yours, but you can't have it yet. You're going to go down for a while into Egypt and there you're uh, going to go into, uh, they're going to be abused there in Egypt as slaves, but I'm going to bring you out 400 years because the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. I'm still extending mercy to the Amorites. Oh, I hope the Amorites get right with me. Oh, I want to give them opportunity. Now, he would know. God knows. Look, if you're here and lost today, on your way to hell without Christ, God knows if you're going to receive him or not. But it doesn't stop him from extending his hand, saying, come to me. I want you to be saved. I died for you. See, see here, the nail scars. I died for you. I love you. Now, he knows if you're going to get saved, but he doesn't condemn anyone to hell. We all go to hell over for the same reason, rejecting Jesus. And he knew the Amorites weren't going to repent, but he was going to still give them. Can you imagine that? 400 years? Generations. That's God's mercy. And thank God for it, because I've had to use his mercy and long suffering in my own life. And so Ephesians here is telling us something that to us we think, well, big deal. This is mind blowing to the Jewish mind. They wouldn't even have gone into a Gentile's house. Now, when Paul penned verse 6, like I said, it was something that was a woo-hoo moment for the Gentiles. But to the Jews, you remember Acts 15? In Acts 15, Paul and the other leaders and Peter, different ones, are called back to, to the, what they call the council at Jerusalem. And they were debating about, because they were trying to make Gentiles in order to get saved, they had to get circumcised. And basically what they were saying is, you cannot be saved and become a Christian unless you become a Jew first. And they decided, hey... They recognized from the word of God and from what God was already doing. Samaritans have been saved. Here's Cornelius and all his Italian band. And boy, they got saved. The Holy Ghost came into them and, and, and all the things that were already happening. They said, nah, <coughs> that's not God's way. God desires that all men everywhere should repent and be saved. And so that's exactly what happened. See, the God, God's word makes it so clear there is no difference. I want to encourage you by this. <coughs> Romans 3 if you'd like to turn there, I'm going to read four or five verses. Romans 3, verse 9. What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. 
guilty. We've all proved it. Doesn't matter if you're a Gentile, we're all sinners. Verse 10 says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Verse 22, at the end part, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Verse 29, is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Verse 30, seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. Wow. This is what God was doing. This was the mystery of the New Testament. Christ in you, the hope of glory, and that we all together in God as one body in the church. Look, we could go on and on throughout the New Testament, but praise the Lord, just like it makes no difference who you are, you're a sinner. You're a sinner. It also makes no difference who you are. God loves you and wants to save you. Hey, we're all sinners, but let me tell you the good news. There's one sacrifice for all. Jesus died for you. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't make any difference where you're from. The Lord Jesus shed his blood on Calvary and died for your sin. He loves you. He was buried, rose again the third day. And right now at this moment is reaching Jesus out of heaven. If you can imagine is leaning. If you're lost here today, he's leaning. The Bible says he inclined himself. He's leaning to us. Picture the prodigal son, the moment the prodigal turned to go back and was headed back, as soon as the father saw him, he ran to him. The Bible says, in Nehemiah, I believe it is, that our God is a God that's ready to pardon. That word ready has the idea of the runner down in the blocks. The moment the gun shoots, ready to pardon. Our God's ready to shoot out the blocks to anyone that would turn to Christ. To repent means to turn to, turn from their sin and turn to Jesus. He is ready to to pardon. He wants to save you. He loves you like that. That's the God we have. Doesn't matter who you are. In Christ, being a Jew or Gentile is neither an asset nor a liability. We're all one. We all share the riches of Christ together. Look, look all identity is lost when you have Christ. The one identifying marker is Jesus Christ. I I'm a Christian. I am a servant. Notice as they open up the books in the New Testament, the, the writers, the human penmen, as they sign their name, the servant of Jesus Christ, the servant of Jesus Christ. It didn't matter where they were from. It didn't matter who their daddy was. There was one that was important, their heavenly father, the servant of Jesus Christ. There are no national, political, physical or social distinctions in the church. We're all one in Christ. Galatians chapter 3 verse 28 says, There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. The full blaze of the New Testament truth was not the property of Israel. It's the property of the church. And the church is for everyone. No matter who. That's God's way. That is the revelation of God's grace. See, Ephesus is not a Jewish town. It's filled with Gentiles. And Paul is writing to help them understand. Do you understand? You're not a second rate Christian. You're not a second tier Christian. You're a first tier. You're 1A. God loves you all. Oh. It makes no difference that Paul, Saul of Tarsus, had been a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Learned at Gamaliel's feet, trained by this scholar. Uh, he was a member of the nation of Israel, a practicing zealous Pharisee. Philippians 3 tells us all about his pedigree. It makes no difference if you're him in the church. He was equal partner with the Philippian jailer and the slave that was a runaway slave, Onesimus, in the book of Philemon. All equal in the church. It doesn't matter who you are here today. God loves you. If you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior... His desire is that you would recognize his great love on Calvary for you. He died for your sins and mine. And if you would say, God, I believe that you died for me. I believe that you were buried. You rose again. And I'm inviting you in my heart to save me. He'll save you. It doesn't matter if you're as young as Charlie down here just had a birthday. Or it doesn't matter if you're as old as I won't point to you. All the old. 
It doesn't matter. Jesus loves you. He wants to save you. Oh, we praise God for it. What a mystery. No Old Testament prophet saw that coming. None. All Jews and Gentiles, one in Christ, one in the church. Wow. Thank you, Lord. Number one, the revelation of God's grace. Number two, the working of God's grace. This will blow you away. This blows me away, this part. Look at verse seven. He's just finished telling about it. Now verse seven, chapter three of Ephesians. Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Hey, Paul's saying, you understand I was a terrorist. Read Acts chapter 8. He's holding the clothes for the people stoning Stephen for preaching Jesus. I was a terrorist. I was beating people, uh, Christians. I was beating and imprisoning Christians. I was killing Christians. I was hunting them down, going after them, going to their houses and hauling people away to prison. I mean, he was not just, if I catch you, he was coming after you like an animal being hunted. That's who he was. And God, he's saying, you don't understand what a God I have. He's worked in me like this. See, we hold Paul up in some high light. He was a sinner. We would call him in our vernacular today, a terrorist that God saved. And wow, what God can do with anyone that will trust him and allow him to work through his life. The working of God's grace. And by the way, that's not just something for back then. God's grace and God's power is at work in our lives all around this room. All around this room. Hey, look, I'm looking at people who were once drug addicts, who were once drunkards, fornicators, adulterers, liars, haters. I'm just talking about the deacons. <laughs> No, I'm, I'm right there. Hey, listen, we, from, the, from the, whoever you think is the very best of us, but God has done a work. Oh, God has done a miracle. God has changed you and changed me, and we are freed from the chains of sin. You understand what God's done? And now we're being, not just we're free and, and praise God, we're not going to hell. We're being used of God to tell others to see souls saved and people discipled and changed from darkness to light, from the power of the devil and the power of darkness, the power of light and the power of God. That's what Paul's saying. I can't believe this. Me, he's using by the grace of God, by his power to share this with you all. And God has done the same in our lives. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Wow, the grace of God. Now, one's headed to the mission field. Hallelujah. Verse 7, he says, Whereof I made a minister according to the gift of grace of God, given unto me the effectual working of his power. See, the mystery not only gives believing Gentiles a new relationship, it also reveals that there is a new power. The Lord Jesus. Christ in you. The hope of glory working. There's a new power available to us in Christ. We'll see that at the very conclusion of the message. This is illustrated through Paul's life right here. Yes, God gave Paul a stewardship that now has been passed to us, but God also gave Paul the power to accomplish that ministry. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 2, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. God not only tells you and shows you what you, and makes you willing and want to do what he wants, but he gives you the power and ability to do what he wants, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. It's God that works in us. And Paul already told us of this power once in chapter 1, verses 18 to 23. What a power. In chapter 1, verse 18, the eyes you understand to be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Resurrection power. That's the type of power we're talking about. And set him at his own right hand in the heavenly place is far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this world but also in that which is to come and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church which is his body the fullness of him that filleth all in all. See we're joint heirs with God and that power is now our power. 
by Christ in us. Look at the end of chapter 3, verse 20. Now unto him, that's Jesus, that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in heaven. That's not what it says. According to the power that worketh in God. That's not what it says. Look at it, verse 20. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. That's what God is trying to get us to see in Ephesians chapter 3 here. Every power that God has, we have available through Christ to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think. Now I'm not talking about some superpower or marvel creature. I'm not talking about that. We're talking about something far more exciting than that. Spiritual power to be a Christian. I don't want to embarrass anyone, but every one of us failed at some point this week in being a Christian. Hey, from the back row all the way to the pulpit. And God says that he's given us the power to live like Jesus, a Christian. And to see our God, he says over and over in the gospel records, your father and my father, my father and your father. And when we pray together, say our father. And he said to his disciples, you'll do greater works than these. It's because Christ's life was going to be in us. Again, some of this, I, I'm just praying all the way through this that the Holy Spirit would help us understand this. Oh my God, help us understand the working of his power. Friend, the point being, oh God, give us understanding. The mighty resurrection of the power of Christ is available to us daily. 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 For life and to serve our Lord. Number three leads us to number three, the wonder of God's grace. The wonder of God's grace, verse eight. Unto me who am less than the least of all saints, back in Ephesians 3, verse 8. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hidden God who created all things by Jesus Christ to the intent that now under the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Oh, Paul never got over the wonder of what God worked, his workings in his life, of what God did in his life. And neither should we either. Paul calls himself the least of the apostles. 1 Corinthians 15, 9. He calls himself the chief of sinners in 1 Timothy 1, 15. And here in verse 8, look at this. Unto me who am less than the least of all saints. I know what we're thinking. I oh, yeah, Paul. <laughs> We, we think of Paul way up here. But Paul wasn't way up here because he thought he was way up here. Paul was way up here as a Christian. We would call him the greatest Christian to ever live. But he was because he realized that he's nothing. Amen. He said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And so... Everything he was, everything we would aspire to be in Paul was Christ that works in us and is available in the exact same way to us. What grace, the wonder of God's grace. Look around this room. I'm telling you, stand in awe, wonder at God's grace. Did you look at the back of the room there? <laughs> Sorry, Michael. <laughs> wonder at God's grace. I mean it. It's a wonder that God could take people like me, like us, and do things like this. Praise his holy name. That's God. That's the Lord. Oh, and he wants to do so much more. And while we're in wonder of God's grace, let's not forget to wonder at the wealth of God's grace. Look at verse 8. He says that I should preach. He's talking about this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches 
of Christ and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning the world has been hidden God who created all things by Jesus Christ. Look, as we've studied this book, we've seen how rich we are. I mentioned at the beginning, verse 7 of chapter 1, the riches of his grace. Chapter 2, verse 4, the riches of his mercy. Uh, chapter 2, verse 7, the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. And then here, the unsearchable riches of Christ. Verse 16, the riches of his glory, he says. The wealth of God's grace, it's truly unsearchable. That word unsearchable riches has the idea of, of like a maze. It's like if you were trying to pile up all the riches that we have in God, you couldn't pile it all up. It's, it's untraceable. If you were trying to count all your blessings, your heart's beating while you're counting and you're breathing God's air while you're counting and God is doing every 23 seconds, every bit of your blood goes through your body. It's cycling back and forth and we're just sitting there. It's a miracle. God. I mean, there's so many blessings in God. There's things that we're talking about today and things you and I are yet to discover from the word of God that we are recipients of right now. It's unsearchable. I can't get to the bottom of it. His riches. It's like Scrooge McDuck swimming in his riches. And old duck tails, if you remember that cartoon. It's unsearchable. The wealth we have in Christ is hidden treasure. We cannot track it down on our own. What grace. Oh, I love it how 2 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 9 puts it. For, we, for ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. But one thing's for sure, we get none of it apart from Christ. None of it. We never enjoy any part of it apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. Science, psychology, politics, social reform, education, culture cannot lead us to this treasure. It's the unsearchable riches of Christ. The spiritual treasure we need is found in Christ and Christ alone. It's been hid in God. Let me read you what John Phillips wrote. Paul revealed a secret that God had kept to himself. He had kept it hidden when he had visited fallen man in Eden, when he talked with his friend Abraham and when he gave the law to Moses. He told David, a man after his own heart, many things, but he did not tell him this secret. He spoke to Isaiah and Jeremiah, to Ezekiel and Daniel, but he still kept this secret. He did not tell the 12 minor prophets and then he kept this burning secret for four more silent centuries. Finally, God sent his son who was involved in the secret. Jesus dropped hints of it here and there, but he did not give it away. The day of Pentecost came, the church empowered, Peter preached, souls were saved and the secret was out, but still men did not grasp it. So God saved Saul, shared the secret with him and said, you tell the world. What a secret it was. God was going to create a church. He would baptize Jews and Gentiles into it, making no difference between them. That church would be the mystical body of Christ. He would raise it higher than the angels. He would seat it with himself in the heavenlies. It would share fully and forever all that Christ has. The church would be his crowning masterpiece. Creation itself, the showpiece of God's eternal power and Godhead, would pale before the everlasting splendors of the church. What a shout of joy there must have been when the secret was first unveiled in heaven. Imagine Christ himself in battle-scarred human body, sitting down at God's right hand, turning to his Father and saying, Now, Father, let's send the Holy Spirit to bring home my bride. Verse 10, he says, To the intent that now, under the principalities and powers in heavenly places, might be known by the church, the manifold wisdom of God. God wants every man to see it, verse 9. This is something that he's given for the church, the manifold wisdom of God. Manifold has the idea literally of multifaceted. Infinitely diversified. It has the idea of many colored I pulled out one of my diamonds today. 
Let me see. Where's come on, Dayton? Come on up here. Just a minute. Look at, the idea is, as you hold this up to the light, you can even see it in the lights there. It's multifaceted, multidimensional. Get your boots on. Come on up here, boy. <laughs> Scotty, you're having to take his shoes off in church. I thought I smelled something. <laughs> oh, Dayton, you can do it. We believe in you. Those skinny jeans don't go well with boots. <laughs> Come on up. Now I embarrassed you. Come on. Here you go. Good job. Hold that up. That's heavy, isn't it? Hold it up there. Yeah. God says as we think of the wisdom of God, it's the manifold wisdom of God. The manifold wisdom of God. Multifaceted. It's many colored. Yeah. You're doing good. He's looking in through it. Whichever way you view God's wisdom, whichever way you turn it, you don't have to hold it quite that high. Whatever way you turn it, no matter how, the new flashes of truth blaze, blaze forth. Listen, his wisdom is inexhaustible. You take the Adam, for instance. A-T-O-M, Adam. Uh, that was first discovered, if you want to call it that. That word was invented by the ancient Greeks. Uh, these building blocks of the universe, everything is made of atoms, right? But that wasn't the final answer. More discoveries followed and the quantum theory was stated. Three families of subatomic, subatomic particles have been named, gauge particles and quarks and leptons. We go on from there, right? Listen, my point is simply the deeper physicists delve into science the more elusive final answers seem to be. Meaning, no matter how big a telescope you ever make, you'll never get to the end. No matter, no matter how strong a microscope you ever make, you'll never find the smallest particles. Because when they think they found it, there's something smaller. Oh, the atom is not the smallest, there's subatomic particles. That's just a little picture in creation of God's wisdom demonstrated. Infinitely inexhaustible, diversified, like this diamond. Think of that. Every time you turn it, there's something else to look at. Thank you, Dayton. You did great. I love your jeans. <laughs> we'll just leave it there so we can see it. This is God's wisdom demonstrated in creation. But think about this. What is true of creation is true of redemption. Look, the Bible where redemption is found. There are verses you and I have known since we came to know God and got into his family. And yet every time we read them, constantly new truths, God is teaching us. Do you understand that? Do you understand that this is greater than all his creation? As you look into this, it's inexhaustible. That's what he's saying. According to the, or verse 10, to the intent that now under the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church, the manifold wisdom of God. Now, God never says something that's not possible. It is possible to know our God just like that. That's what he's desiring us, to know him like that. Oh, what a mighty God we serve. Even the angelic beings, that's what he's talking about in verse 10, the principalities and powers they're looking down, if you will, and the demons are looking as well and are learning and standing in awe of God's grace seen in the church, being worked out in the church. I imagine the devil thought, this is a crazy plan. You're going to take these people? You're going to take Paul, a terrorist? You're going to take this demon-possessed maniac of Gadara? And God, working in the church, what he's doing is unbelievable. Verse 10, he says, to the intent that now under the principalities and powers in heavenly places, their watching might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. 1 Corinthians 4, 9 says, we are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. Not that you and I are special. We know that's not true. But that our God has made something this amazing, the church. And that God is his power in us. The church isn't a corporation. The church is you. The church is me. That God would do this type of thing in me, in us, is unbelievable. The angels watch the outworking of God's salvation and they praise his wisdom. 
God's riches and wisdom, they're so vast you cannot discover their end. Question, are these riches available to every believer? Yes, not just Paul. That's the wonder of God's grace. The wonder, the manifold wisdom. Number four, lastly, the eternal purpose of God's grace. Verse 10 or 11, according to the eternal According to the eternal purpose which he purchased in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. See, this great truth concerning the church is not a divine afterthought. It's according to God's eternal purpose. God's eternal purpose. Verse 9, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. God wants us to see this, all men. He hid this mystery in himself from the beginning of the world, but now he wants it made known everywhere. Think of this, the mystery, the sacred secret that was so important to Paul. He's in prison for it. Don't forget about his chains. Here he is in prison. This important secret didn't be known to all Gentiles and to the angels. It's now in our hands and all believers are to be a steward of it. I want you to see it. It says there, in verse 9, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. Uh, Paul said that this was revealed to him and uh, the dispensation there, that word there, had the idea of stewardship. In verse 2, if you've heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which has given me to you, word, how that by revelation, he may know to the, me, me the mystery. Now he's making it known to the church and he says to make all men, all the church, see that is what is the fellowship of the mystery. So you and I, this mystery has been hidden in God. We are now have become stewards of it. That's why 2 Timothy 2, 2. The things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who should be able to teach others also. That's why discipleship. That's why Paul would say in 1 Timothy uh, 6, 20, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. That's why Jude would write, leading into the Revelation, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered. We are in a stewardship. The church is being assaulted on every side. You could go to many churches right here in Shelby County and Jesus, his church that he died for is unrecognizable when you hold it up to the New Testament. We are stewards of the mystery that we find of the word of God and what the church is to be. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Not a social club, it's not an entertainment venue. It's we the church empowered by God to go and change the world. Remember what Paul said at the close of his life, I have fought a good fight. I have finished, the uh, finished my course. I have kept the faith. He wasn't saying he didn't, oh, I made it. I didn't deny the faith. Any of you tempted to deny the faith? No, he was saying the trust, the stewardship I received, I carried it and I passed it to the next generation. And it's going strong. And it was the next generation took it further. And it's diminished over time of the truth of the mystery of Christ. And you and I have now come into stewardship of it. What do we do with it? The truths of God's mystery, the truths of the gospel and the mystery were guarded, preached, it, preached and handed down to faithful men. Preached it. Verse 11, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Listen, God plans. This is his plan. God's plans is that the center, the center in the church is to be all about him. We, look, God's plans which center in the church, it centers in us that our purpose, <laughs> we're a part of his eternal purpose. These are plans that he made before time began. And by the way, God was not surprised by the fall of man. He's a God that knows all. He was not surprised at Lucifer and, and God, his Lucifer's fall. And God is omniscient. His wisdom foresaw even these tragic events that sin would bring. But his answer was the cross of Christ. And by the cross, through the cross, he displayed his wisdom, love, and power as a means of redeeming fallen man and rebuking fallen angels. 
Verse 12, it says, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. It's according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom, Christ Jesus our Lord, we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. When you understand this truth, it gives you a great faith and confidence that if you work with him in obedience to him and his word, he will work in you and for you and through you. If we could get a hold of that in a nutshell, that's what the message is all about. That God desires to work in you and for you and through you. All of his divine resources are available to those who sincerely want to do his will and help him accomplish his purposes on earth. We now have friends and we must understand this right now. We now have full access to God's presence we can draw near to him and to his throne. We can come directly to him at any time, day or night, with confidence of a son or daughter. We can come before his throne. No one in earth, no one in heaven, no one in hell can bar our way to the access. That's God's love for us. Confidence in, in the verse uh, 12 there. We have confidence in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. It has the idea of confident assurance. You know, growing up, I would not have had confident, confidence, assur confident assurance to go into my neighbor's house, open the fridge, pull some food out, and eat supper at the table. Would not have confidence of that. But I had confidence many times to go in my own house, my father's house, open the refrigerator, get food out, and have dinner. In fact, I love getting to my mom's Oh, I could even right now think of some coleslaw. I love her uh, pickled beets, her pickled carrots. Well, we'd get into stuff. Never mind the cookies and all that, of course, but when you get older, things like that come to mind. You can't buy at the store, you know. Although mom was pretty strict if I got into between meals. <laughs> But he says boldness and access. This boldness has the idea of free speech. I can come to God and you can go to God and we can talk freely and openly, openly to him. I don't need some mediator to come between me. I don't need some priest to go through. I have access. I don't need an advocate. No, no. In other words, verse 12, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Can you imagine showing up at your parents' house and there's someone guarding the door? I'm going to let you in. And excuse me, I need to go in. You can't come in. Do you understand who I am? Oh, I can take a message to him, but you can't go in and see your father. Get out of my way. I'm his son. I'm going to see him and talk to him. We have access. We would have boldness like that. Look, we don't need some priest or some pretender, some person between us and our father. You have access. Let me conclude with verse 13. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, I don't know what it was. I don't know if the, a soldier laughed out loud as they heard Paul. Look, if they understood Greek, they heard Paul dictating all this to the secretary. As he's talking about his standing in Christ while he's in chains. I don't know what it was, but something brings it back down to earth here. Verse 13, wherefore I desire that ye faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. My tribulations for you. Me, the prisoner of Jesus Christ. Something brought him back down to earth. Stark contrast, Paul, between your spiritual claims and your physical chains. See, Paul's glorifying in his limitless resource in Christ. While the harsh physical reality is he was awaiting trial and eventually execution at the hands of Nero. But Paul realizes, of course, how others might be viewing the situation. Here he is in chains. His sentence is sure. He inserts a sentence here to reassure his readers since they too might, and some already were, face tribulation, facing tribulation for their faith. But he had long 
since learned to glory in tribulation. Look at this in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Do you understand? Anything is worth it if we have the power of Christ rest upon us. My power and my strength is so limited, it's not even worth talking about. But his power is everything. Verse 10 of 2 Corinthians 12, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distress, for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then am I strong. See, Paul focused on the glories of heaven as he faced trying circumstances on earth. Chains and beatings really didn't matter. He could endure trials and tribulations of time. He knew eternity was to follow, and that's what mattered. And all of what we've been studying today, God's grace shown in his power and wisdom, the access, the boldness he granted us. All of this has give, been given us completely in Christ. We appropriate them by faith. But if we disobey God, he doesn't revoke them, but we do not get the benefit of them. And I don't want to meet Christ that way. Lose the enjoyment, the enrichment. I don't want to meet Christ that way. Without having used his grace, his power, the manifold wisdom of God and all that he purchased for us with his precious blood to the fullest, the fullness of Christ. Okay, yes, pastor, we get it. All right. No. No, no, I don't think we do. At least we've not acted on it as a church much in all our life or in the lives of the last several generations of Christians. You, you know, we read about people like Moody and we read about people like Spurgeon. We read about great missionaries and we think there was something different because of the time. Look, the world's always been wicked and evil. We think something was different because the people, people have always been Lazy and a tendency to go into sin. All we like sheep have gone astray. We're all prone to wander. But we think somehow it's different. But I want you to know, oh my God, give us understanding. God wants to live through you. Literally, Jesus living through us. All him, none of us. Our part is yielding, waving the white flag of surrender to God every day. Lord, I'm yours. Our part's yielding. Obedience. His part is the doing. The living of the Christian life. Us just enjoying the ride. Enjoying watching his grace and power at work in ways we could not imagine. Come on, pastor. Seriously. It's that simple. Absolutely. Absolutely. That is exactly what God is telling us. This is what Paul is praying we would grasp and believe by faith and let it activate in our life. Reckon it so, reckon it true. Look at verse 20 and we're done. Look at verse 20, end of Ephesians 3. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh. Say those last two words with me, would you? In us, in us, God is waiting for you to believe that. God's waiting for me to believe that. To believe him. And that is how God is going to get, verse 21, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Amen. Let's just be real honest for a moment. I'm through. As you look at the last 50 years, as you look at churches, as you look at Christians, I'll tell you what's in the news. Another pastor. Another pastor fell. 
Another pastor caught up in immorality. Another pastor, this or that. There's a Christian down at the bar. Our God has not been getting great glory in the church. No, the church has been bringing a reproach upon Christ by and large. Oh, I thank God for faithful Christians here. I'm not trying to be down on you. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is now unto him that is able to ex do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. And when that happens, unto him will be glory in the church. Is your life bringing great glory to God? You're the church. I'm the church. We have it all in Christ, the unsearchable riches, the access to God, the power for him to change our life and use our life to change many others. Will you bow your head with me in prayer?